so this uh, state functions and physical properties of substances is kind of like a, a grand tour of thermodynamic variables. And a lot of them are partial differential equations. And we'll talk about those, but most of this course has been, I would say, focused on applying those, those equations. What we lost by going into statistical mechanics, which if you'll notice in the book is pretty far back in the book. It's typically not covered in this course. But I like it since I teach quantum mechanics first to make that bridge. Well, the thing that we lost in those few weeks is the ability to go through and derive all of these differential equations. And so you may hear some peers from other universities say, oh yeah, my thermodynamics class was nothing but Cal 3. That's what they're talking about. They spent all this time deriving all these thermodynamic properties and showing what they show. Um, and I remember in graduate school, we did that. And I remember my professor going on the board and just you know filling up the board from left to right. And it's just partial differential equation after, you know, after another. And then he would say, aha. And then he would circle this result. And to me, the aha result looked just like any other partial derivative it was earlier in this sequence. And I was totally lost. I mean, I was following his math well enough, but I didn't know why he said aha on one thing and not three things earlier. Because it was just equation, 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 aha. And so I said, why aha on that? And he said, because this is measurable. And that made an interesting point. You know, you may have some of these intermediate results and you wouldn't really have a good experiment for measuring that thing. But when you get to a point where you have a change in temperature with respect to pressure, you can run something through a pinhole and see what the temperature change is and you measure the pressure drop. And so that's the Joule-Thompson coefficient. And so we have certain properties in thermodynamics that have been developed using these partial differentials. And when we get to something that's, that's experimentally verifiable or can tell us about the property of a substance, that's the aha. We stop there, and then that becomes a thermodynamic property. So we'll talk about these different ones. It's kind of a tour today. Not so much things that you need to write down and focus on remembering, but just sit back and enjoy some of the results of thermodynamics that we have. So we'll go through things of, of uh, how the volume changes with respect to pressure, or how the pressure changes with respect to um, temperature changes and so on. So we'll look at all of these different thermodynamic properties. But, but, but first, let's, let's do a little bit of uh, foreshadowing and, and talk about cycle problems. And so I just sort of lined out this state function manipulations. Let me make a, a, a couple of important points about these differential equations. We have two types of differentials, exact and inexact. Inexact differentials are path dependent. And so if you were to try to integrate or differentiate heat and work, it's going to depend upon the particulars, whether it be, say, uh, expansion against a constant pressure or isothermal reversible expansion. Those are two different paths. And you have different amounts of heat and work done in those two different paths. So, so the take home lesson is that heat and work are path dependent. But change in energy, change in pressure, volume, temperature, enthalpy, uh, Gibbs energy, those are not path dependent. Okay. And so those would be exact differentials. And so let's look at what we mean by an exact differential. Let me jump ahead past this and look at the exact differential. So if we have what we call an equation of state, and that's one of your vocabulary words for this week, an equation of state, this is an, an equation that sort of groups together all of the different state variables. And the one you already know is the ideal gas law. If you think about the ideal gas law, if you solve that for pressure, it tells you how the pressure behaves when you change the other state variables, when you change the volume, when you change the temperature. A lot of times we fix the number of moles, and so it'll end up in the denominator under volume, and we call it the molar volume. And so that would be an intrinsic property of a substance, the molar volume. And so we have this equation of state. So if we take that equation of state and we differentiate it, we do a total differential. So it's got two variables inside. It's got a volume and a temperature. And we wanted to differentiate. See how it changes with respect to both of them. When you have two variables, 
which one do you start with? Do you start with the, the uh, <coughs> slope with respect to volume or the slope with respect to temperature? And the point of an exact <coughs> differential is it doesn't matter which one you do first and which one you do second. And so that's just showing this for the ideal gas equation of state. You see that we take the, the derivative of the partial derivative of our equation of state with respect to volume and keeping temperature constant. And so we treat temperature as a constant and we take the derivative with respect to volume. So there's volume to the minus one, so minus one comes out front and we decrease the exponents and now it's minus two. And temperature was kept constant because of this T. Then we differentiate with respect to temperature. It's temperature to the first power and so we end up with this. So that would be what we get if we started with volume and then we did temperature. What if we swap those? We start with temperature and do volume. We get the same result because this equations of state, one of the requirements of an equation of state is that it be an exact differential equation. Yes? So why is work an exact differential? Because I thought work was path independent in the sense that it was like, I don't know, that's my physics understanding of that theory. Work is, is uh, definitely path dependent because think about the two paths for going from V initial to V final. If, uh, if it's a constant pressure, then the volume uh, expands straight across. You know, it's, it's an isobar. And so you've got from V initial to V final, you've got a different path in the pressure axis. You can go straight across at constant pressure or you can do a uh, reversible isothermal expansion. And then it follows that PV equals NRT line. Do you, do you follow me? I'm, I'm picturing in my mind that, that indicator diagram that we had last time where we had P, I, P, F, and we could go down like that. And so this was V, F. <clears throat> and VI. And so let's say we do an a, a irreversible expansion. So from P initial, we say pop a valve and the pressure immediately drops down to P external. And then we expand against that constant pressure. Then this is the work that we did. But if we did a reversible expansion, this is a different path, and we have a different amount of work. So work is definitely path dependent. But the energy from this point here to here is going to be path independent. We can take the initial <laughs> variables and the final variables, and we get the same energy regardless of what path. The things that are different are the ratio of work and heat. So in one case, you get more work out and less heat. In the other case, you get more heat and less work. But the delta E, or delta U is the same. Yes? Um, could you just think of that as, like, uh, <clears throat> I don't know, the work that takes to go to the grocery store? It has to go, okay, so in order for me to be able to grab in here, but if I want to I can also drive all the way to Houston and all the way back and then mm -hmm. and I end up in the same place. So yeah. Take a lot more work. And I think of it too as like if I'm on the second floor and I want to get to the first floor, that's the delta U, the delta energy. Okay? I could jump down or I could go down the stairs. So one way is, is a dramatic difference in terms of, I guess, I don't know how to compare those to heat and work, but, but there's, yeah, you know, there's which one has more work, which one has more heat, but you, there's going to be a difference in me walking down the stairs slowly. That would be like a reversible process, and the other would be irreversible. <coughs> Jump off the, the second floor and land on the first. <laughs> but that would be a, a good analogy for reversible versus irreversible. Yeah. So. And so the result here, and again, this is a more just of a survey. This is a requirement for our equations of state that they be exact differentials. And so are you going to, you know, is this going to be a major part? No, this is just a survey of things. So just sit back and enjoy. These are some of uh, these thermodynamic quantities. You know, doing these partial differentials, we could differentiate 
any one of those variables with respect to any of the others. And we can throw energies in there too. And so that's what that whole first third of the course really in many other schools is, is just deriving every one of these. Okay, and doing all of those uh, partial differentials. <clears throat> so these are things that, that are measurable and these are things that are important to our everyday life and our applications of thermodynamics. We have the volumetric expansion coefficient. And what I would like for you to do is just look at this, these uh, different uh, uh, partial derivatives and tell me what you see there. What is this volumetric expansion coefficient? We have a volume and we have an expansion. And so if you think about this, this is uh, the change in volume with respect to temperature. And so we change the temperature and the volume changes. And if we raise the temperature, typically the volume increases. We also have the isothermal <coughs> compressibility. So isothermal means you're at a constant temperature and it's compressibility. We change the pressure and the volume gives a little bit. So it, it's compressible. Okay. We have the Joule-Thompson coefficient. You know, the, the name in this case doesn't tell you much. It's a combination of Joule and Thompson. But it's the change in temperature with respect to pressure at constant enthalpy. And so we have uh, a pressure drop typically will give a drop in temperature, but not always. Okay, and so we'll look at that one. And then we have this internal pressure. And this one is an interesting one from my research. This says if you change the volume of a substance, the energy changes. And that's really strange. Okay, and so that's. Uh, that's what we have for uh, our Hansen solubility parameters. And so in my research, it's talking about the intermolecular attractions and repulsions. By changing the volume, what am I having to do to the molecules? I'm having to pull them apart. Because the molecule doesn't change its volume, but the intermolecular attractions have to change. And if I expand a liquid into a gas, I have had to break all of those intermolecular attractions and that changes the energy quite a bit. And so this gives me an idea of how cohesive a liquid is, how much energy I have per volume in terms of those intermolecular attractions. So let's go through these one at a time. We'll kind of look at some tabulated values so we can kind of get a, a feel for what, what, what nature has to offer in terms of these values. So this accounts for the change in volume with, with temperature. It's given the term beta. And so here we are reusing beta. This is not uh, 1 over kT in this case. This is the, the um, volumetric thermal expansion coefficient. Some books have alpha. And so I went ahead and, and derived this for an ideal gas. So it's pretty simple. You've got the equation of state. We're going to look at how volume changes with temperature. And so here's our volume. We solve for that. This is the equation of state for volume. And we want to take the partial derivative of this equation with respect to temperature. And here's our, uh, our thermodynamic quantity. So we're, gonna, we're going to apply this to our volume. So we're differentiating the volume with respect to temperature, which is pretty simple, NR over P. And then it has this 1 over VP. So this is the result, NR over VP. All the units cancel except for inverse Kelvin. And so what this tells us is it's 0.082 per Kelvin. That's our expansion coefficient. And this brings up a point. When you have a coefficient, it's something that is multiplied by the quantity that it's changing. And so this is a volumetric coefficient. And so this would be the, the um, multiplier on volume. This is going to tell us that the volume changes by 0 0.082 for every degree Kelvin for an ideal gas. Okay. So you could say it's 8.2% um, change in volume per Kelvin. So if you take this and turn it into a percent, you see it's 8.2% per Kelvin. Now, why did I put it in terms of 10 to the minus 4? Well, in this table, we have these liquids here. And these values, uh, <clears throat> at the top it says 10 to the minus, or 10 to the fourth times beta. So that's saying that this 18.1 is equal to 10 to the fourth times beta. So beta is 18.1 times 10 to the minus four. 
So 18 times 10 to the minus 4. And so a, an ideal gas is 820 times 10 to the minus 4. So you can kind of compare the, the uh, volumetric change of a gas versus the volumetric change of a liquid. And so this is mercury. Mercury changes 18.1 times 10 to the minus 4 per degree Kelvin. And notice how it's much bigger than all of these others. That would make mercury really good for measuring temperature, wouldn't it? Mm -hmm. If you put mercury in a confined space and you change the temperature, its volume changes with respect to temperature. And that's what our mercury thermometers are based upon. And not only is mercury, uh, you know, it's, it's opaque, and so it gives us a good mark for our line. And you could use alcohol, but we're losing a little bit. So here, alcohol 11.2 or 14.9 for methanol. I think most of the time they use ethanol. And so, you know, it's, it doesn't change as much as mercury does. It's okay, though. We could just put a different, uh, a tinier capillary in that tube and make, a, make an alcohol thermometer. Then you're not dealing with toxic mercury. Ah, oh, but there's a problem. Uh, alcohol's not opaque. <laughs> so we got to put a dye in there. Sometimes the dye separates and you'll get dye up into the capillary other places and it, it's, you know, so mercury thermometers are really great until, you know, a freshman student stabs it into his hand like happened here many years oh. ago. <laughs> yeah, it was bad. Uh, they was trying to put a thermometer into a rubber stopper and it wasn't part of the lab at all. It was just messing around. And there's ways to do that. And since, you know, since this happened, I want to tell you how to do it. You have the, first you have an appropriately sized hole in the stopper, <laughs> number one. Number two, you put a little glycerin in there so that the thermometer can slide through the, through the rubber. Okay, he didn't have the glycerin, he's twisting and it twisted and it jabbed and, and it cut a bunch of tendons in his thumb and he had to have surgery. And so we're sitting around the department saying, what do we do? I mean, are, you know, are we liable? Well, he wasn't following procedure. And it says in all of your lab manuals, you are forbidden from doing things that are not in the lab procedure. So we don't want you in there lighting stuff on fire and, and sticking thermometers and stoppers when you're not supposed to. So we're a little bit off course, but the main point is mercury changes as far as liquids quite a bit, but not as much as a gas. And that makes sense. You heat up a gas, it changes. Quite a bit. Every degree Kelvin can give you an eight percent increase in volume for for an ideal gas. What about what about solids? Well, over here now it's ten to the ten to the minus six. So silver here is times ten to the minus six per Kelvin. That's not bad. But even then, may not be ideal. Mm -hmm. um, think about volumetric changes with respect to temperature for dentistry. This is huge for dentists. And so if you're going to put something in a filling in a tooth and it changes its size, its volume with respect to temperature and you, you drink something hot and it pushes on that nerve because it expands a little bit, you want to find a particular alloy that's non-toxic, that's you know got a decent melting point or whatever that you can put into that, that tooth uh, but also has a r almost zero, if you can get a very low volumetric thermal expansion coefficient, because you know the, the native material is going to expand and contract a little bit. You want it to match the tooth, and your your tooth has a volumetric expansion coefficient as well. So if you want that that filling to match the tooth material, so that it doesn't crack the tooth open or yeah, you know mess with that, it also is thermal <laughs> conductivity. So the metal. If it's a metal filling, it will conduct heat straight to the nerve, and that's also some of your pain sensitivity. Do you know the new compound they use that's like two colors? I don't. I really yeah. don't. I wish I did. Yeah. They were using one of my old, and now it's like uneven because they used to have like four. They're the same size. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I've still got my fillings from when I was eight years old or something yeah. like that. <laughs> don't tell my dentist. <laughs> So then we have isothermal compressibility. So that was thermal expansion. Now we have change in volume with respect to pressure. So you put pressure on something and does it squish? Does it give? Okay. So this is the definition of the, the isothermal compressibility, thermodynamic function. 
Again, we're doing the derivative of volume, so we'll solve our equation of state for volume. And we'll differentiate that with respect to pressure, keeping the temperature constant. So now NR over P comes over, and then uh, we have, uh, uh, we're differentiating with respect to pressure. So it's pressure to the minus one. So this negative sign is canceled out. So we have a positive value down here, and we have pressure to the minus two power. We have the one over volume here. And so with this piece right here, we have uh, 24.1 bar. So again, this is the change. It's the coefficient that's multiplied against the volume. So the coefficient would say that the volume would change 24.1 for every bar, or 2,410%, or 2,410%. So it changes quite a bit for every, every unit of pressure. What about liquids and solids? These are all 10 to the minus 6 values. So for aluminum, 1.33 times 10 to the minus 6 per bar. Uh, liquids, still times 10 to the minus 6. So when we say that, uh, like down here is water, so 46 times 10 to the minus 6 per bar. So when we say liquids and solids are not compressible, this is what we're talking about. They don't change volume when you put pressure on them. They do a little bit, but not much, compared to an ideal gas. Okay, Gases are very compressible. You change the, the pressure by one bar, which is close to one atmosphere, and they change a huge amount, 2,400%, Okay, 24 times. Uh, but if you change the pressure on a liquid or a solid, very, very little. Now, this is important, though, because we do use liquids to um, actuate things. In other words, think about all of your hydraulics. So you've got a backhoe, and you have a hydraulic pump, or even in your car, the power steering pump. In, in that backhoe, they push the pressure, and it's wanting to scoop up dirt. Those big shock absorbers, they look like shock absorbers. They're hydraulic actuators. So you're putting pressure in and pushing a piston and sliding that bar out, and it's making the machine do what it does. If you had a, a squishy liquid in there, then your pump would lose some of its pressure. So it's pushing on that liquid, and some of that pressure is going into changing the volume of the liquid. It's not efficient. So you would want a liquid that's got a low isothermal compressibility so that you lose less of your force to heat and to compression. And you want all that force to go to that shock absorber, and you want the volume of the liquid to stay constant as you put pressure on it. Yes? Uh, they're, they're in, either, either in our book or the, the previous book, but you can just look up these isothermal compressibility and you'll find tables. Yeah, there's a lot of engineering references online as well. So you can find these values if you're curious about them. Yeah. Now let's talk about the Joule-Thompson apparatus. And so the Joule-Thompson, there's several different ways to measure this. This is one uh, way. It's the Joule-Thompson apparatus where you have uh, gas coming in at high pressure at the bottom, going into a porous barrier. Now, you've used porous barriers before when you did uh, these little fritted glass filtrations. That's right. Do you remember those? Mm -hmm. It was a little crucible, and it had a white plug at the bottom that looked like it was, uh, mm -hmm. you know, like a, a solid barrier, but it was actually little beads of glass that were packed in there, and then it was warmed up around 500 degrees, uh, which is the melting point of Pyrex. So just under the melting point of Pyrex, the edges of those spheres got soft and sticky, and they stuck to each other. And then you cool it down very slowly. And so if you think about a, you know, a jar of marbles, there's lots of paths through between the marbles. And that's what those fritted barriers are. So it'll hold water because of the capillary action of water. It will stop, you know, it won't flow through. But then if you pull a vacuum, you can overcome that, um, that surface tension effect of water. So you can pull the water or the liquid through and leave behind the precipitate. So we, we have those crucibles for filtration. You can do the same thing with metal. So you can take brass beads or steel beads, and you can put those into a form and heat them up very close to their melting point, 
and get those beads to stick together and you can make porous barriers out of metal. And so you might see that in the NMR room, we have various different things used to fill doors and I haven't seen one, but there may be one up there. I haven't really looked, but they make uh, brass fritz. And so at the end, to keep the liquid nitrogen from shooting out and spraying everywhere, they'll put a brass frit at the end to have kind of a controlled release of the liquid nitrogen, and it'll come through that fritted area. So this would be, that, that blue barrier would be one of these metal frits. And that pressure would go from a high side to a low side through that frit. And there would be a temperature drop. Now this is the same kind of aerosol effect we have uh, it really isn't as popular today as it was when I was a kid, but they had, you know, underarm deodorant was, was uh, aerosol, like right guard spray. And you spray that stuff and it was cold, okay? But the can's not cold. And as a kid even, and before I was a scientist, I was like, that's weird. Why is it cold, Ooh, you know, when the can's not cold? Isn't that strange if you think about it, that you spray it and the gas is cold, but it's not cold in the can. And that's what's going on here. The gas goes through this barrier and reaches a, a, a low pressure area and all those molecules are pulled apart. Well, those molecules were in close contact with each other and they had intermolecular attractions. You can't pull them apart without putting energy in. And if you don't have a source of energy, then the temperature of those molecules drops. Another way, if you think of temperature and velocity, if, if we don't like each other, we're gonna come away with a certain velocity. If we do like each other, we just can't quite get away. Drag it out, you know, and the hands just barely come apart. <laughs> and we come, across, come away with very low velocity, and it's cold. It's, we've lost some temperature. We've lost some energy, and that, that can be measured in the form of temperature. And so if we put a thermocouple on the high-pressure side and the low-pressure side, we can measure that temperature drop. And this is also the point of refrigeration. We take gas, we compress it outside, and we sink the heat of that compression. And then we expand it through a frit on the inside, and it gets cold. And then we run our air past that cold side, and we get air conditioning. So this is a fantastic thing. So here's the Joule-Thompson coefficient. Uh, <clears throat> you can take the derivative of temperature with respect to pressure at constant enthalpy. Now that's a little strange. Okay. And so we can rearrange this and make an isothermal Joule-Thompson coefficient, which depends upon the heat capacity. So uh, this equation is a little more useful. In fact, this is how we measure the Joule-Thompson coefficient. We actually measure the isothermal Joule-Thompson coefficient. So let's look at this thermodynamic surface here. So here's the enthalpy as it depends upon temperature and pressure. And so the isothermal Joule-Thompson coefficient is at a given pressure, as a, at a given temperature. So it's isothermal. So we pick a temperature, and so the temperature is constant in this direction. And this is the plot of enthalpy at that temperature. And if we pick a particular pressure, we can take the partial derivative of enthalpy with respect to pressure at constant temperature and we get this slope. So the instantaneous slope of this enthalpy surface is the isothermal Joule-Thompson coefficient. So you kind of see how that works? Now how does it relate to the to the real Joule-Thompson coefficient, not the isothermal one? So this one now is the, the uh, derivative of temperature with respect to pressure at constant enthalpy. So enthalpy is the y-axis in this plot and if we come across to that curve we would see if we draw this, this line here and we extend it over to that curve, we're, we're going to have this contour like this. That's the constant enthalpy line. Do I see nods on that? Okay, there's a constant enthalpy line. It's like a contour plot on a, on a map. Okay, and so then the, the Joule Thompson coefficient would be the instantaneous slope of the temperature with respect to the pressure at constant enthalpy. And then these two, these two um, coefficients are related to each other by the heat capacity. <clears throat> so let's look at a, a typical experiment. So if we have this setup, 
we could measure the temperature drop, or we could actually put in some joules to make sure the temperature doesn't drop. And so how much heat we have to add in, in terms of joules, to keep the temperatures the same would be a measurement of the energy loss. And so we put in a heater, the gas goes through a porous plug, and we have the heater, uh, sort of the, the uh, controller of how much heat or current goes through that heater is controlled by the temperature difference in these thermocouples. Very simple circuit to, to set up. And so if we have six moles per minute going through here, and it's a pressure drop of five atmospheres, and the heater is running at 10 watts to keep those thermocouples the same temperature, we can calculate this isothermal Joule Thompson coefficient. So the, the units of the isothermal Joule Thompson coefficient are going to be joules per mole per atmosphere, and so we have 10 watts, so that's 10 joules per second, and we have six moles per minute, so we need the seconds and minutes to be compatible, so we put in 60 seconds per minute. So the minutes have canceled, the seconds have canceled, and we have joules per mole per atmosphere, and that's our isothermal joule Thompson coefficient. And then since this is a gas, we can figure out the, the heat capacity, if it's 40 joules per mole Kelvin, then we can calculate the joule Thompson coefficient, which is mu T divided by CP, and we get 0.5 Kelvin per atmosphere. So you can look at that and you say, well, we get about a half a Kelvin drop for every atmosphere change. And so we have to have a pretty high pressure, low pressure differential uh, to get a decent cooling effect for this particular gas. And every gas is different. Why would that be? So let's back up a little bit and think conceptually. Why would gases be different in terms of how much cooling there is? <clears throat> is there a difference between N2 and Br2? What would be the difference? Size? What, when we say size, though, think about what we're using to determine the size of a molecule. We're, the nuclei have hugely different masses, but are we really talking about the nuclei when we're talking about size? What are we talking about? The electron clap. And we need to think about polarizability. So there are three types of intermolecular forces. There's dispersion, polarity, and hydrogen bonding. So we're not really talking about hydrogen bonding, although that would be a difference that you could throw in there. We're not really talking about polarity, although you could do that. For, for nitrogen versus brom bromine, we're talking about the size of the electron cloud and how polarizable it is. So these would be instantaneous dipole-dipole attractions. Nitrogen is really tightly held, small atoms, small electron cloud, bromine, enormous electron cloud, so it's very polarizable. These are London dispersion forces are what we're talking about. And so you would want a molecule with large, fluffy electron clouds. <laughs> so that's why chlorofluorocarbons are great for refrigerants, and they're bad for the ozone hole. <laughs> okay. So we had chlorofluorocarbons, the fluoro part didn't do too much for us, but the chloro did. And so the more chlorine atoms you had in there, the bigger the electron cloud, the more intermolecular attraction, the better the cooling effect. And so now they're taking HCFCs, hydrochlorofluorocarbons. So they took off one of the fluorines and put a hydrogen on there. And now it's friendly for the ozone. Why is that? Yes. It, but it, the, if you were to get it up there, it probably still would. But why does it not make it to the upper atmosphere? A hydrochlorofluorocarbon doesn't make it that high. It's not, it's not heavier. It's actually lighter. So it's not that. It's Very good. You get a sticker on that one. Why is it reactive? What's, what's reactive about it? Um, the chlorine. I'm going to take your sticker away. What did we change? <laughs> What did we change? We went from chlorofluorocarbons to hydrochlorofluorocarbons. And the hydro... Yeah, which is, so which is more reactive with oxygen? A hydrogen, a fluorine, or a chlorine? Hydrogen. The hydrogen. Yeah, so you're right, it's more reactive. So I'll give you a sticker. And, and it's, it's all we had to do was to change the reactivity of the molecule. 
to change the reactivity of the molecule, now it reacts at the, at the lower level and with oxygen and gets chewed up. And so it doesn't make it to the stratosphere where it can destroy the ozone. So our new modern refrigerants have hydrogen in them to make them more reactive. Or a lot of times they'll make things with double bonds. And so double bonds are very reactive. And so then that also reduces their global warming potential because if they get destroyed by oxygen, uh, then they don't stick around and, and uh, persist in the lower atmosphere. <clears throat> this Joule Thompson coefficient is, uh, it, ch it changes sign, it, it's, it, its variables change depending on where you are in terms of pressure and temperature. So if we were to plot the Joule Thompson coefficient say, on an axis coming out of the board, and the, you know, the y-axis is temperature, the x-axis is pressure. Notice the pressure units are huge. I mean, it goes up to 400 atmospheres. Okay. And you know, we're talking about moderate temperatures. 300 Kelvin is roughly room temperature. And so we have here for, for uh, nitrogen, nitrogen gas, this is, this is the sort of boundary where the Joule-Thompson coefficient changes sign. And so here it's greater than zero, and this would be a cooling regime. Here it's less than zero, and that would be a heating regime. So if, if I'm in any of this white area, and I expand or I take nitrogen and put it through a pinhole and there's a pressure drop, I actually get heating. So the gas heats up. That's weird. So not all gases cool when they, when they experience a pressure drop. Some of them heat up. But at room temperature, roughly, any moderate atmosphere change, you know, we've got 200 uh, atmospheres, we would have a cooling effect here for nitrogen, but not for hydrogen. So at room temperature, um, you know, any of these pressures, we would have cooling for nitrogen, but hydrogen would heat up. And so that's a problem if a hydrogen tank at room temperature, one atmosphere, uh, gets a leak it would heat up. The pinhole would actually cause the, the, the area around that pinhole to heat up because the gas would come out, it would be a drop in pressure, but the temperature of that gas would be hot. And so it might make the hole bigger. And so this Joule-Thompson effect uh, is, is a very odd effect. Now, how can we understand this? Think about the pairwise potentials. We did this for the Joule-Thompson, not Joule-Thompson, the Leonard Jones 612 potential in that lab and it was this figure here. We focus a lot on the attractive regions of a molecule. So when molecules get anywhere in this region here, they're attracted to each other. And so if you pull those molecules apart, there's gonna be a drop in temperature. But if you stuff so many molecules into a small space, Sort of the average distance between those molecules is too close. And you end up up on this side here. If your volume or your pressure is too high, meaning your volume is too small, right? you've stuffed way too much gas into a small space and now your pressure is, is too high, then your molecules want to get away from each other. And when they experience that pressure drop, not only do they, do, they expand, but they get this excess energy here. And so this excess energy here goes out in the form of velocity, which is higher temperature. And so this is a way we can understand that, that inversion where we go from a, a, a cooling Joule-Thompson effect to a heating Joule-Thompson effect is where we've crossed this line in our average intermolecular distance. And we've now got too many molecules stuffed into a too small a space. We can use the cooling regions to make refrigeration. And so these are the different types of models of refrigerators. This is the simplest one, this Lind refrigerator. So we compress the gas and then that heats the gas up. And so then we let the, the heat radiate out into the room. So this is on the back of your refrigerator. Then you have a wall of your refrigerator here. And then that high pressure gas comes through here and goes through a pinhole. And so there's the metal frit or a pinhole 
and as that liquid, as that gas comes out, sometimes it cools so much to, to liquefy. So it'll actually cool enough to become a liquid. And, and so then you've got this liquid with a really low boiling point. And you put water in here in an ice cube tray. Okay. Look at that. Okay. And then that water is hot compared to its environment. And so the little IR photons are coming out of your water. And some water molecules are evaporating and bouncing into the side. And that heat's being transferred to this liquid, and it's boiling that liquid. And that liquid has a really low boiling point. So it holds the temperature of that surface at the boiling point of that liquid, and it's below freezing. And so water is in thermal contact with this surface, and then water freezes. And then the liquid that was boiling, those hot, now boiled gases are still kind of cold. They cool this gas as they go past, and they come around to the compressor. And then they get compressed and sink their heat to the room. And so it just pumps the heat out of your little water in the ice cube tray into the kitchen, back of the fridge. And then you do this cycle over and over again. Now, ammonia is a really good uh, refrigerant, but it's also toxic. And so this, uh, you know, they had some early refrigerators based on ammonia and there was a leak and the ammonia came out and killed the people in the house. This uh, surprised Einstein and they, they felt this was really bad. So Einstein and Zillard wrote a patent for this closed system, ammonia free refrigerator, no moving parts and no seals. Essentially, it's all glass blown together. And the, the Einstein refrigerator is based on this. Now, it's a lot more complicated than what I just drew, but it still works. And then uh, these other things are just some definitions, thermodynamic definitions. But let me go back to this. This baffled me, and that we're almost done. This baffled me that we could use a flame to refrigerate something. But you could replace this compressor with a flame. So you have a little propane torch and a flame. And it heats that gas up, it expands, it goes into this through a little flapper valve and sinks that heat, and now you've got a high pressure area. So you can.